So now we're going to have a look at the other two rock types. We've looked at igneous rocks and the processes that occur with that rock type. We're now going to look at the other two, sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks. So we've, as we've seen, igneous rocks form from magma and lava, and they give us volcanoes and other features. Sedimentary rocks, very simply, sedimentary rocks are made up of bits and pieces of other rock types. And then metamorphic rocks are changed rocks. And we can have a look at those three different rock types and arrange them in what's known as the rock cycle. So this diagram here, we looked at igneous rocks, which form from magma and lava. They can then, through the processes which we're going to look at now, through weathering and erosion, can form into sedimentary rocks. And then sedimentary rocks, through the processes of heating and pressure, as we'll see later, can form into metamorphic rocks. And if you continue to heat those metamorphic rocks, then you can turn them back into igneous rocks. And that's why we call it a rock cycle. However, it's not a nice, it's not always that complete cycle. You can get igneous rocks turning into metamorphic rocks without going through sedimentary rocks. You can get sedimentary rocks turning into back into igneous rocks without going through metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks can become sedimentary rocks without going back into igneous rocks. So although we call it the rock cycle, there are many um, shortcuts, if you like, that can go between one rock type to another. Okay, so let's just look at how, let's simplify it a little bit. Let's have a look at how igneous rocks can go to sedimentary rocks. So we need to look at the types of processes that occur for that to happen. So we're going to look at weathering, we're going to look at erosion, we're going to look at transportation, deposition, and then lithification. All right, so we'll look at the first one, which is weathering. So weathering is, put simply, is the breakdown of rocks into smaller particles. And there are two types, there's physical and there's chemical weathering. So let's have a look at some certain types of physical weathering. One of the simple ones, we'll start with mechanical weathering. And a good example is what's known as frost wedging, where water collects in uh, cracks in the rock, it freezes, it expands, and pushes a part of that rock away from its original, what we term the parent rock. And so that's breaking that rock into, a, into smaller particles. That's weathering. And you can often see that occurring in mountainous regions where you get uh, frost overnight and forming what's known as a talus slope at the bottom of steep cliffs, which is a good example of where you're probably getting some frost weathering occurring. Other types of mechanical weathering, you can get abrasion, where uh, you have the collision of particles, um, either under water or by wind, bashing into each other and um, filing off, if you like, the sharp edges of particles. So breaking again, breaking that into a smaller particle, but also changing its, its shape from more angular to more rounded. You can get mechanical weathering, such as pressure release fracturing. Check this video out. Okay. Ho, 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 ho. Ho, ho, ho. All the way down. This whole seam now is active again. Lots of activity down below. It's still lifting. Did you see that? It just popped right up. I felt that one. Little, little piece flew into the air. Yeah, baby. Now it maybe you'll be happy. Everything is flat again. Those, those, all those pieces that were lifting just went back down. Wow. Pretty good, huh? So what's happened there, so that rock was originally under huge amounts of pressure, but then some of that, the outer layers have been removed, and then all of a sudden that rock has been able to expand and cracked that uh, the outer layers, that's pressure release fracturing. You can also get mechanical weathering by organic activity, so plant roots, 
growing through rocks can push them apart, breaking the rock into smaller particles. Animals can do the same, burrowing through them, um, scratching them out, creating, um, creating smaller particles from an original parent rock. Um, and another one is thermal expansion. So you can have a rock and it can heat up. It might be out, uh, let's say, this often occurs in desert regions where you have a big diurnal difference in temperature. So very hot days and very cold nights. So the rock, as it heats up, will expand and as it cools down, it'll contract. Now the heating and cooling generally only occurs on a thin outer layer of a rock. And so as it heats up and cools down, it expands and contracts, expands and contracts, and that continued change in, in uh, expansion and contraction will cause an eventual crack in the rock that often occurs in the thin outer layer. The other type of weathering is chemical weathering, and there are these are the main types, dissolution, hydrolysis, and oxidation. The first one we'll look at is dissolution, and as the name suggests, this is where the minerals are completely dissolved. Now water itself can do the dissolving, it dissociates weakly and acts like a weak acid, but it's more common when the water falling as rainfall combines with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to produce this weak carbonic acid by this equation here. And then that carbonic acid can then dissolve the minerals. The best example, although this can occur with all minerals, the best example is the dissolution of calcite. It's quite a soft mineral. And as you've probably seen in many limestone caves, this is the process that's occurring most commonly. So the calcite itself is dissolving away, leaving behind the remnants of the calcite and forming these beautiful uh, features that you see in limestone caves. The second one we'll look at is hydrolysis. And this is where water reacts with the minerals in the rock to produce a different mineral and usually a softer mineral. So the hydrogen or the hydroxide in the water replaces an iron in the mineral. So a good example here is orthoclase, which is a feldspar. And you remember that I uh, showed you the, uh, that minerals have a unique chemical formula. Well, if you remember that that was the chemical formula for feldspar, orthoclase feldspar. And in this chemical reaction, and by the way, don't worry, I'll never ask you to repeat these or remember these equations. They're just for demonstration purposes. But the orthoclase there reacts with the hydrogen and needs water to produce a free potassium ion and then that new mineral called kaolinite, which is a, uh, a clay mineral that um, you've all seen if you've uh, brushed your teeth. Toothpaste is made up of kaolinite often. And also leaves behind quartz. It's a much more resistant mineral and it, um, by that process, of the hydrolysis of orthoclase, you end up with soft clay mineral that can then weather even more quickly and left behind with more resistant quartz. This is a, a classic example of what occurs in granite regions where if you look at the soil, it's very coarse and sandy because all the feldspars in that original granite have been converted to kaolinite and weathered and washed away more quickly, leaving behind the quartz, which gives you the sandy soil. The third type of chemical weathering we'll look at is oxidation. And again, we'll start with a chemical equation. So on the left-hand side there, we have the chemical formula for olivine mineral. And it first needs to uh, undergo the process of dissolution. You can see there with the weak carbonic acid and it produces uh, free iron. And then that iron reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere to produce a new mineral called hematite. And so in the process, that original olivine has been broken down into different and smaller particles. You can often see the effects of uh, oxidation and other types of chemical weathering in, a, in an image like this, where you've got the presence of the unweathered, in this case, uh, granite rock, uh, nice and white, and on the surface, which has been exposed more to the atmosphere and the weather, um, have uh, demonstrates a, discoloration of the surface. Now that discoloration are new uh, minerals that have undergone the oxidation process. Now the other type of oxidation which is very close to my heart, I spent many years studying uh, processes related to this, is where you have uh, rocks, or in my case I was looking at soils, but the same process occurs, 
that can are uh, high in a mineral called pyrite. And you may have seen this stuff. Um, it's also known as fool's gold. Um, it's iron sulfide, and when it reacts with oxygen in the presence of water, uh, produces free iron, but also produces sulfuric acid, um, which in the studies I was looking at was then washed out into estuaries on the far north coast of New South Wales and killed a lot of fish. This was what's known as uh, acid sulfate soils, or if it occurs in a, in a more um, rock-based um, process in mines, for example, it's often called acid mine drainage. Now, there are some confusing definitions when we talk about weathering. We can talk about the different sizes of particles. So when rocks break down, they can break down, that's the point of weathering, is it breaks down into different sizes. And the different sizes are defined by different names. And the different names are sand, silt, and clay. And you can see there in this table here that each of those names have a different size range. There are larger um, there are larger sizes, cobbles and pebbles, but we'll just concentrate on sand, silt and clay. So there's a size definition for each of those. Sand's between 0.02 and 2 millimetres. Silt is between 0.002 and 0.02 millimetres. And then clay is the very, very fine material, less than 0.002 millimetres. So sand is quite coarse. You know what sand feels like. You've been to the beach, you picked it up. That coarseness, that's what we call sand, but it's also something we call, we give it a, it's a name for a particular size of particles. Clay, you know what clay feels like, it's mud if you like, it's that very fine slippery stuff, and then silt somewhere in the middle. But what's confusing about them is that two of those terms also have a meaning that relates to the material itself. Sand, we often use to describe the breakdown of quartz. Now that's related because quartz is very resistant, so it does tend to stay larger in size. And clay, we, tend, we also use to describe the breakdown of feldspars and micas. Okay, they're quite different material, they're quite different minerals. That also makes sense because the breakdown of, because feldspars and micas are much softer. Remember that, that uh, muscovite mica that we could see through? Where did I put it? That muscovite mica we could see through is also very, very soft. I can actually bend it and, in fact, pull apart the layers of the mica itself. So it's very soft, so it tends to break down much more readily into much smaller particles. So you just need to keep that in mind that we use these terms sometimes interchangeably, related, but some, that nonetheless um, interchangeably. The other thing to consider is the shape of the particles, and this is really important. Sand, especially when it's broken down from quartz, forms rounded particles. So it's quite large rounded particles, a bit like a beach ball. Clay, on the other hand, tends to form very flat particles. Very small, but very flat, like a piece of paper. And that's really important to consider. So clay, like this picture shows, this is an electron, mic electron microscope image of clay. And you can see how it's very, very flat. And that uh, distance bar there, scale bar, shows you how small it is. Okay, so sand is very large, relatively large and rounded. Clay is very flat and very, very small. Now, how do we then go from igneous rocks to sedimentary rocks? Well, we need to go through the processes of erosion, transportation, and deposition. And these processes are facilitated by, usually, water uh, or wind. Okay, so let's look at erosion. So erosion, simply defined, is the detachment of particles from that parent material. So weathering is the breaking of it into smaller particles. Erosion is then the movement of that particle away from its parent. Uh, in a river, there's two types. There's, in, which we can call stream erosion. There's hydraulic action, where the water itself does the eroding. So the water picks up the particle and moves it away. There's also abrasion, where particles already in the water can bash into other particles and move them away from that parent material.
So it's hydraulic action and abrasion. Okay, let's have a look at the relationship between stream velocity and stream erosion. So this is the velocity required for the particles to be detached from the surface. Along the x-axis there you can see particle sizes ranging from the very smallest clay up to the large gravels and along the two y-axes they're the same but as different units of stream velocity, they're logarithmic scales. So very simply what's being shown at the moment is that if you start at sand you need progressively faster streams in order to detach larger particles from the stream surface and that makes sense. The larger a particle gets the heavier it is the faster the stream needs to be in order to detach that, that particle. If we reveal what's to the left of this graph it doesn't seem to quite make sense. Instead of that line continuing to slope down towards the left which would indicate that you only need slower velocities to pick up the smaller particles it goes in the opposite direction. So it's indicating you need faster and faster stream velocities in order to pick up even the smallest particles. And that doesn't quite make sense if you compare it to what's happening on the right, but that is in fact what is required. The properties of the smallest particles, like clay, remember they're quite different to sand, they're actually different minerals. Well they have properties of, you can put it as simply as stickability. Clays tend to stick together, and we know that's for a fact, when you go out after a rainstorm into the mud and the clay sticks to your boots. Well, the same thing's happening on riverbeds. You need faster and faster velocities in order to overcome that uh, the cohesive nature of very small clay particles. Sands don't have that property. You can pick up wet sand on the beach and it'll still fall apart, but wet clay tends to stick together. Okay, so once a particle has been weathered and eroded, it then needs to be transported. So transportation is just the movement then of that eroded particle to somewhere else. And again, it's done by wind or water, or in fact by ice in glaciers. Now, the way things are moved, will, and how far they're moved, and how fast they're moved, will control various features and they are sorting, size and how round they are. Let's have a look at how transportation affects the sorting of material or how let's have a look at how different sizes are, are moved. If a particle is so weathered that it in fact dissolves then it can be carried in water as, as its original elements. So it's essentially dissolved and it's carried in solution. So that happens. So if you get a sample of river water and analyze it, there will be minerals dissolved in that, in that water, mineral water. If the material is not, so, not dissolved, but is not large enough to sit on the bottom of the, of the river, then we call that being carried as suspended load. And if you've ever seen a muddy river, well, that's a whole lot of particles being carried in suspension. We call that suspended load. And then the third way is by traction, where the particles are rolled along the bed of the river, or saltation, where particles are bounced along the river bed. Saltation, great word, nothing to do with salinity. That's just the fancy word we give to particles being bounced along the river. And that will, of course, depend upon its size but also on the velocity of the river. A faster flowing river will carry all particles of all different sizes, including the largest ones. But as that river slows, as we can see here, then the largest particles will drop out first and then just carry progressively smaller particles. And then as the river slows down even more, then it will start to drop out progressively larger particles and larger particles and larger particles. And so this gives us, an in, this, this process will then have a tendency to sort particles. If a river moves gradually from fast flowing to slow flowing, as it might from the mountains to the sea, then as that river gradually slows, it will gradually drop out 
particle sizes along a continuum of sizes. Larger particles will drop out first, smaller particles will drop out last or eventually make it all the way to the, to the ocean. What usually happens is that only the finest particles, which particles would they be? That's right, the particles of clay, would eventually make it all the way to the, uh, the river mouth and end up going into the, into the ocean. Now, let's have a look then. So what happens then? What, is, what are we talking about when we say drop out and can't carry? Well, that's the process then of deposition. So we've had weathering, we've got erosion, got transportation, and then eventually deposition. So if we just concentrate on the deposition in water, similar process occurs in wind, but it's easier to understand if we just look at it in a stream. So as we've mentioned, the size of the particle that is deposited will depend on the velocity of the river. And it looks something like the, the, the relationship follows this uh, represented in this diagram here. So in this diagram, which we've seen before, but this is a different part of it, it's just showing the relationship this time of the stream velocity and the deposition of the sediment. So that line extending from right to left is just showing us that the smallest particles will be deposited under the slowest flowing river and that the largest particles will be deposited even in fast flowing river systems. So it's, it's a fairly uh, obvious relationship. The process is occurring at the time that the particle is dropped, we can say, is its environment of deposition. What was the environment like when that particle got, got dropped? All right, or it's the type of landscape in which a sediment is deposited. So what was the environment like? What was the landscape like when that particle was deposited? So if we have a gradually slowing particle like this, so a gradually slowing velocity of water like this, then we know the resulting sediment is going to be well sorted because the larger particles were gradually dropped out much earlier in the river system. And as the river gradually slowed, then, then progressively smaller particles were dropped out. And so at any particular velocity, you'll get particles about the same size. And so we can say it's highly likely that the particles are going to be well sorted. Alternatively, if we're out in the environment somewhere and we see some sediment that's well sorted on a floodplain somewhere, then we can go, ah, so the flow of the water must have been slowing fairly consistently. Okay. However, what happens if the flow of water stops suddenly? What's going to happen? So like this diagram. Here we can see the water slowing, slowing, and then suddenly it stops. What's the sediment going to be like in that environment where the water suddenly stops? Well, it's going to be very poorly sorted. Sure, some of the larger ones would have dropped out earlier, but it's still flowing relatively uh, moderately fast, so it's still carrying a wide range of particles. But if it suddenly stops, then all of the particles that are being carried by that water at that time will drop out and you'll get a big bunch of different sizes. So we call that poorly sorted. And so where does this occur? Well, if you think about it, where do you get water flowing that suddenly stops? And the most common area is on a relatively steep slope that suddenly gets flat. You can sort of say a waterfall, but that doesn't quite cut it. What happens, the, the, the large scale environment where that occurs is in an alluvial fan. So this diagram here shows a, an alluvial fan where the water's coming down that river quite rapidly. So it's still carrying lots of different particle sizes and then it suddenly stops at a very flat area and all those particles just get deposited. Okay, so as long as you understand the relationship between erosion and deposition, and this diagram I find really useful to, uh, to go over to help you to understand the relationship you can, you can see you'll be able to understand that relationship between uh, river velocity and particle sizes. Now, why is this useful? Well, this example, this is a really good example here. This is a picture of uh, a cutaway, uh, a road cutting, and you can see some very different particle sizes. And they change, they're in different layers, aren't they? And it's these layers 
that tell a story. That layer at the bottom has lots of very large particles and is very poorly sorted. So what do you think the environment was like when those particles were deposited? It probably was a very fast flowing river that, that stopped relatively quickly because there are lots of different particle sizes. But then something happened over thousands of years where the layer above it now seems much more well sorted. So the environment must have changed, gone from a fast flowing river to something that stopped rapidly to a river that was continuing on at a moderate velocity, slowing down at a moderate velocity, slowing down slowly, so it would drop out relatively well sorted, it's not, not perfectly well sorted, but relatively well sorted, more well sorted than the layer below. And then there's another layer above that. What was the what must have the environment been like when those when that material was deposited? Well, sort of somewhere in between. It was probably slow, flowing a bit slower because you don't have the biggest pebbles and cobbles there. But it does look fairly poorly sorted. So you can say, oh, well, it was a moderately flowing river that then stopped quickly. So you, in this same place, you've got examples of three different environments. And that has happened over time, that the environment has changed. And you can tell what the environment was like by looking at the particle sizes in the rocks that then are exposed. Okay, so just summarising that, the environments of deposition, in mountain rivers, you're going to have largest boulders. Okay, if it's, if it's continue, if it, the, the issue of it stopping suddenly, we're just going to uh, ignore for the moment. So if the river is slowing gradually, you'll get your largest boulders in mountain rivers. In the midland rivers, you'll get it ranging from sort of larger than sand through to sandy sediments. In the lowland rivers and floodplains, you get the finer material, um, silts and clays. And then in anywhere where a river then flows into a lake or a swamp, then where the water is completely still, that's where you'll get your finest material. If, it's, if it slows gradually right down and then eventually stops in a lake or a swamp, then that's where you'll have your finest material able to eventually settle down, settle out. Okay, so that's um, deposition in river systems. Let's have a look at deposition in coastal systems. It's a little bit different. Now, in coastal systems, you have this sort of relationship. You've got rivers coming in from the, main, from the land, but you've also got the processes, you've got marine and ocean processes occurring, coming in from the ocean side. And the main physical process that occurs from the ocean side is, of course, waves. Now, in such circumstances, you've got sediment then coming from two areas. You've got sediment coming down in rivers, and you've also got sediment being moved by wave systems. So where does the sediment come from on the ocean side? It comes from the weathering and erosion of the headlands. So as the headlands weather and particles are then eroded off, they're transported by the wave processes up onto the beach and are deposited. Now the relationship's not quite as simple as uh, the river systems, but nonetheless it's still it's still related. The faster the waves, the bigger the particles they can deposit. If it's a gentle wave system, then they can only carry small particles. So on surf beaches, those, those waves are quite, um, are quite, quite fast, and so that they can carry large particles, sand particles. Whereas on areas that are protected by, say, the barrier reef, where you don't get a surf beach, you end up with quite muddy coastlines. It's also related to the, how the rock type from those headlands as well, but nonetheless, that, that relationship still, um, still exists. The other main feature that's occurring on the coastline is beyond the beach, so beyond the breakers. So as the river systems come down and deposit the finest material, the clay particles, because they've made it all the way to the coast, they, will, they won't be deposited on, the, on, say, a surf beach, they might be deposited on a protected beach, absolutely, but they won't be deposited on a surf beach. They will be continually moved out by the, by the waves. The, as the waves come in and move out, they're flowing fast enough to carry those finest particles. And they will move out beyond the waves 
and eventually move out to the open ocean. And in the open ocean, it's very, very calm. I know we sometimes think of oceans being dangerous and huge waves, and yeah, sure, they do sometimes. But on the whole, they're actually very, very still. So still, in fact, that the clay particles have time to eventually settle down onto the ocean floor. And that's where eventually all particles will end up. So even the largest particles will eventually be broken down into the finest particles and they will find their way out onto the ocean floor. Okay, so we can have a look at this sort of relationship here where we've got the landscape going from the beach to the far shelf. And at the beach, you usually have coarse sand. So we're looking at a sort of a surf beach relationship here. Beach, you have coarse sand. In the near shelf, you have smaller sand particles. And then in the far shelf, you have uh, clays. And sometimes there are no uh, particles at all because it's so far from the, from the coast that no particles ever make it out there. And you have a different type of material being collected, and that's the body parts of animals, which is a different type of rock. Okay, so we've been looking at particle sizes. What's, what's, why is it talking about particle sizes? I thought we were talking about rocks. But if you remember, I said that sedimentary rocks are made up of particles of other rocks. So that's why it's important to understand particle sizes and what affects particle sizes so that you can understand different rock types. So how do you go from sediments to rock? It's called the process of lithification. Lithic means rocks. So if, if you've ever into national parks, indigenous areas where you have lithic art, that's rock art. And how you get a rock forming, how you get a sedimentary rock forming, nothing to do with igneous rocks, okay? They may have weathered, eroded, transported and deposited bits and pieces. How do you then transform those bits and pieces into a rock? Well, it's through the processes of pressure, where the water is squeezed out from in between the spaces, between the particles, and you get compaction, and then any of the small amounts of usually silica or other minerals that may have been dissolved as the sediments were being deposited then dry out and act like a cement that then binds those particles together again. And yes, it takes millions of years for that to generally happen. Okay, so what's the relationship then between particle size and the eventual sedimentary rock that we get? Well, if we have a rock that's come from clay-sized particles. So the sediment is, was clay, the environment of the deposition was still, so that we just had clay forming. When that clay becomes a rock under the process of lithification, what do you reckon the rock type is that we get? Well, we get, nice and simple, we get a clay stone. So the particles in here, if we were to sort of grind this up and let it fall apart, we would see that they, they would be very, very small fine and also flat particles. And in some rocks like mudstone, also we can call it shale. That's another type of sedimentary rock made up of very fine particles. But in shale, those flat clay particles have aligned themselves a little bit to give us this very flat surface. Whereas a mudstone, the particles haven't quite lined up properly. So a rock forming from clay can either be called claystone or mudstone, that's interchangeable or if it has a particular look to it, nice and flat, we can call that shale. If we have rock forming from silt-sized particles, what do you reckon we call that rock? Siltstone. Exactly. And if we have a rock forming from sand-sized particles, we have a rock called, you guessed it, sandstone. If you rub your fingers along sandstone, then you can, get, you can feel that grittiness, so the particles are much larger. They're sand-sized particles. And if you get a rock from a whole different range of particle sizes, what, what do you reckon you call that rock? No, you don't call it different particle size rock. It's got a special name called conglomerate. So here's an example here. You can see it's all got lots of different sizes, particles all pushed together. And here's a picture of another one where you can actually see the large pebbles forced together, lithified together in a, in a rock. And we call all of these types of sedimentary rocks clastic sedimentary rocks. Now the last type of sedimentary rock which is quite different are chemical sedimentary rocks. The most common type of chemical rock is this one. Fairly nondescript like this but if you look closely 
you can see fossils in it. This is fossiliferous limestone and that forms from the body parts of marine animals where their body parts are made up of calcium. And over millions of years after the animals have died their skeletons fall to the um, floor of the ocean and again they're compressed and they become lithified and turn into limestone. If the fossil shapes are preserved we call it fossiliferous limestone but if it's squashed so far that the images of the body parts disappear then we just call it limestone. There are different types of different types of limestone. Uh, you can tell if you've got limestone or not you can get some hydrochloric acid and put a drop on it and if it fizzes it's a dead giveaway that it's limestone. Okay so that's sedimentary rocks remember you have igneous rocks which formed from magma and sedimentary rocks which are formed from the breakdown of particles of other rocks and we classify sedimentary rocks by their particle sizes. We're now going to look at some sedimentary landforms and the features that occur in sedimentary rocks. Okay so this is one of the most well-known landforms in Australia. It is of course Uluru. It's made up of sandstone. So once upon a time there must have been a moderately fast flowing river that uh, deposited the sand and indeed millions of years ago there was in fact a very large mountain range that was eroding away into an inland sea that deposited this sand um, on one side and that sand then eventually uh, lithified to form uh, Uluru and on the other side there was a very poorly sorted sediment that developed in, a, um, in an alluvial fan which formed Katajuta. And so if you look closely at the rock types of both Uluru and Katajuta you can see the differences. So on the left there is the sandstone of Uluru which was deposited in an alluvial fan but it's much more well sorted so the water must have been flowing moderately fast and slowing more slowly. Whereas on the right hand side you can see the, the very different uh, and mixed up conglomerate of Katajuta. So in its alluvial fan the water must have stopped much more rapidly depositing a very, um, so, a very varied range of particle sizes that eventually hardened or lithified into its conglomerate. Um, if you live around Sydney then you probably have seen sandstone in the Blue Mountains which is now a thousand meters at its highest above sea level. How on earth, so if you've got lots of sand there, how, how did, what was its environment of deposition? Well, it could have been a river, but in fact it wasn't. It was a beach, it was the coast. How on earth can you get sand that was formed in its environment of deposition was a beach, a coastline, that is now a thousand metres above sea level? Another example of where you get sedimentary rocks that are currently above sea level, and that's the Nullarbor Plain. In this example here, it's a good photo, it's black and white, but it tends to show the, uh, the differences there. You've got two types of limestone. You've got the Nullarbor limestone and you've got the Wilson limestone. So its environment of deposition must have been out in the middle of an ocean, a long way away from, from the coastline, and in fact it was 60 million years ago. We had a very large part of the continent covered by an ocean and that's when these limestones were forming. The first one, the one at the bottom, the white, white and more whiter one, was forming in, a, in an inlet, sorry, forming in an ocean that was about 60 million years ago and then something happened and in fact the ocean disappeared and went away and 10 or so 20 million years went by and then the ocean came back and a different type of animal, marine animal, was forming under different conditions, still floor of a shallow ocean. But the animals that were collecting there were different and formed a slightly different coloured limestone. Still a limestone, but a different type. So most, sediments, so most sedimentary rocks will form in a watery environment because they're usually carried by water. Yes, you can get sediments carried by wind and you can get dune formations that then also form rocks. But how can we see them today if they formed underwater? Well, two ways. One is that sea level has risen and fallen like we saw with that Nullarbor limestone. 
so the sea level has now dropped, exposing the Nullarbor Plain, or the land itself can uplift, which is what happened in the Blue Mountains. Okay, now one of the other things that you can see in rocks are layers. And now this part of the subject is related to what we term stratigraphy. And we do a lot of that in our in one of our pracks as well. So this will relate to directly to that to that prac. So you can see in many rocks, as we saw in that Nullarbor Plain, different layered limestones, or different layers made up of two different limestones. And here are just some other examples. So this is, um, anybody know where this is? Yes, that's right, it's Grand Canyon. And it's the classic case of layered rocks uh, being exposed in a fantastic feature. And yes, I went there a long time ago. Color my hair. Um, okay, so we can get large, we can get quite thick layers appearing in sediments that are deposited in water. Something's changed to give us the different features, different colors and the different particle sizes. So either the environment has changed to give us different particle sizes, or the source of those sediments has changed. The river moved around, instead of eroding off a basalt plain, it eroded off a, off a, a, a granite area and gave us different colored sediments. The climate changed, so then we had a faster flowing river and then it dried up, so it was a slower flowing river. So whatever happened, the, it's reflected in those different layers. So there's another example here of some beautiful <coughs> layered uh, sedimentary rocks. You can also get small scale layering. And I mentioned this previously when I showed you that sample of shale. In this case, where you've got the, remember I said the clay was very small, but very, very flat. Well, this is a good diagram that demonstrates that. The flat clay particles will be deposited and they might look something like that um, there on the, on the left, or is it on the right? Over this side. And under pressure, those flat particles can then align with each other. And if that's preserved, then you can get a very flat surface as we saw in the shale. If it's not, for some reason, the, the particles don't align, then you can get mudstone or claystone. You get some other fantastic features preserved in sedimentary rocks. Dinosaur footprints, for one. Um, just amazing that you think that sometime, tens of millions of years ago, that um, some dinosaur walked across this muddy or sandy, usually muddy, uh, area, left a footprint, and something must have happened to fill that that hole, and then more and more on top of that, that eventually turned into a rock, and then that rock was eroded away, and you just happened to walk past that landscape at the precise moment when that overlying rock type had been removed, exposing the, the footprint. Same deal, you may have seen uh, ripples in rocks. Have you ever been on a beach, and you see the ripples on a, on a beach in the sand? Well again, if they get covered by a layer of, of an, another rock, another sediment, usually clay, that can preserve those layers, cover them up, then that all turns into a rock. That clay is then eroded, weathered, sorry, weathered, ero weathered eroded, transported away, exposing the ripples in the rock like that. This is one of my favourites. Raindrops can happen, can be preserved in, in sedimentary rocks as well. Just, just fantastic. Okay, so when we're looking at stratigraphy, one of the things we can tell is which layer of sedimentary rock is the oldest. So that layer at the bottom is going to be older than the one that's above it, and that's going to be older than the one that's above that, and so on and so forth. And so that we call that relative time. Now there's another time scale in geology called absolute time, and that's the time that's divided up into different epochs and eons. And you may have heard of some, like the Jurassic or the Carboniferous. They are specific time periods that have been aligned with certain dates of years ago, millions of years ago. But when we're looking at stratigraphy, we're not really worried about that because we're not dating the rocks. We just want to know which is the oldest, which came first. That's likely, but not always, likely to be the one at the bottom. And when we look at stratigraphy and use the relative time, we can start to piece together geological histories.
So if we go back to our diagram of the, or our photo of the nullarbor plain, which of those two limestones is older? Well, it's going to be the one at the bottom, the Wilson limestone, the white one. And so we can take this diagram of, a, um, of layers in rocks. should also say it doesn't have to be just sedimentary rocks. You can get a layer of, um, of igneous rock, um, and you can also get metamorphic rocks squeezed in there as well. But we'll just sort of use sedimentary rocks as the, as the, uh, as the basis upon which to examine what stratigraphy is. So in this diagram here, where you've got one, two, three, four, five layers, which is the oldest, and that's the one at the bottom, which is layer E, then D, then C, then B, then A. Okay, now you can, each of those will have a name, that could be sandstone, that could be um, shale, that could be mudstone, whatever. Okay, so that's at its simplest. When the layers are nice and horizontal, and nothing's happened to them, then we can easily assign relative time to the deposition of those layers of sediment, which have then subsequently become rocks. However, there are some complicating factors. Take this photo for example. Here we have what look like white lines passing through this greyer rock. Now those white lines are igneous rocks. And they've come up and they've entered cracks through existing rocks. Now, just by saying they've entered rocks they've entered existing cracks through a rock, you immediately know that, that the igneous rock that's come up into those cracks must be newer because the other greyer rock must have been existing there to start with. So this principle of cross-cutting relationships, we can determine, by knowing that principle, we can still determine which rock type was earlier than the other. Again, looking at, at a schematic diagram, such as this one, there we have our horizontal layers and then we have two dikes that have entered into the, the rock type, dike A and dike B, sorry, 3, and dike C. Just by looking at that, which one must have come first? Well, it must have been dike C, because it's then subsequently cross-cut by dike B, which has then subsequently been cut by dike A. You don't get a dike sort of, like B couldn't have come um, after A, because it just doesn't stop. The, 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 the physics of the natural um, geological processes means that it must continue in one long line. So it must have been C, then B, then A. But each of those dikes came well and truly after the deposition of those layers of horizontal rocks. But it's much more complicated than that. And this diagram I've been using for a long time, I collected this postcard, in fact, from uh, the Grand Canyon. Um, it's uh, well, near the Grand Canyon, one of the national parks near the Grand Canyon, and just is a great example of sedimentary rocks, which are a bit bent, and we'll look at how that happens. And then you can see that volcano cross-cutting right across those layers of, of other rock type. And this is a real um, cross-section. Now, there are further complicating factors, and that's to do with folds. So when you have moving, when the earth moves, either large scale, plate boundaries moving or just earthquakes moving the, the earth itself, you'll often have folds occurring. So rocks, even though they are hard, um, if you squeeze them over with obviously very large forces over long periods of time, they will in fact bend. And when they bend, they can bend into these folds. And so we can also assign relative time to that particular process. So in that top diagram there, those sedimentary, those rock layers must have been there before the fold, and then the fold occurred afterwards to give them, them, to give them that shape. So you can now start to introduce processes in this determination of geological histories. You can give the order of the deposition of those beds, and there are one, two, three, four, five. They all must have been there at the time that the folding occurred, because they're all folded in the same pattern. Similarly with faults, when the forces of pressure are so great that it doesn't fold, or so rapid that it in fact cracks, you can see faults occurring and splitting of the, of the, uh, of the rock, uh, of the layers of rock. So each of those layers of rock must have been there, they all must have been existing at the time that the fault occurred, because they've all been fractured.
And so you can get small folds like this diagram occurs, which is um, quite a, um, a cl it's a close up of a particular feature with lots and lots of small tight folds. Or you can get very large folds, which we in fact call tilting. So when you see a landscape that appears to be, you can see there the flat layers have been tilted up on its end a little bit. Now, we call that tilting because we can't actually see the fold. But if we have a look at this photo, and this is of Tabletop Mountain, which is just outside Albury, you can see that the top of that mountain is tilted down towards the, the left. And that's in fact just one arm of a fold that would have looked something like this. And then all of the fold on the right hand side has been eroded away, just leaving that arm. We just call that tilting. I mean, it is a fold, but we, because it's lost the, the apex and the other side, we just say that the landscape has been um, folded. Uh, sorry, has been tilted. Uh, there are different types of faults, um, and this, these diagrams here show the different faults. And you put them all together, this is another postcard, you can see here there have been folds on the right hand side there, and there's also been some tilting and some faults have occurred as well. You can see how they've displaced the rock types. So we've now seen how folds and faults can interrupt the nice sequential uh, deposition of those horizontal sedimentary beds. But there are other complicating factors too. In this example, you have the sequential deposition of sediment under the ocean, but then sea levels can fall, exposing those sediments to erosion, removing some of those beds. Sea level can then rise again, and you get more deposition. So here we have horizontal beds deposited, but they're not just one after the other. There's actually a time uh, lag or time difference between two of those beds. And that represents a period of erosion and can be many millions of years. And the term that we give that is a disconformity. Now, there are other complicating factors um, related to, these, uh, to this process. We have here an angular uh, unconformity. So let's have a look at that. So again, you've got your sediment deposition underneath the ocean as per normal, if you like. And then the ocean disappears, but more than that, you get folding and uplifting. So now you've got uh, folded beds, then you get erosion, and then you get sea level rise again, so you get more sedimentation on top of that. And in this case, you've got what's known as an angular unconformity, because not only is it representing a period of erosion uh, of one horizontal bed between another, you've now got uh, a period of erosion demonstrating on top of uh, folded beds. So we call that, because the beds are now, I guess, at an angle, we call that an angular unconformity. So the key principle when looking at stratigraphic diagrams in relation to faulting and folding is that faulting and faulting affect all the rocks that exist at the time. You can't get partial folding of existing, of different rocks that all existed at the same time. It just doesn't happen. They're either all folded in the same pattern or they're all faulted. If something looks doesn't look right, then there must have been, highly likely, have been some sort of unconformity, some change in the in the environment to uh, to be able to have different patterns or what looks like different processes affecting only parts of the diagram of the stratigraphic diagram or the rock face that you're looking at. Okay, I hope that helps.